like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit and, and, and talk about outflows from uh, quasars. Um, to start off with, I would like to show some mock shots of some of my uh, collaborators. Uh, one of them is probably in the audience right now. Um, <clears throat> Which one would that be? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so um, why are uh, people interested in, in quasar outflows? Um, well, we've heard a lot of reasons. I'll just quickly go through a few of them. Um, people who are simulating the, the uh, ma uh, mass distributions of uh, the mass functions of galaxies realized that um, they were getting too many large galaxies. And uh, um, so once they actually included a quasar feedback, uh, they realized the observations could match the simulations. So uh, you need uh, quasar feedback of some kind to uh, uh, understand uh, the simulation. So uh, we've uh, shown recently the M sigma relationship, which also is an indicator of some feedback process between the central source and the galaxy. And also we heard about today's uh, possibly uh, co-evolution of star formation and quasar number density. All right, so um, depending on what type of conference you go, you you hear uh, a mechanism for feedback is, which is the most prevalent. Uh, I'm going to talk about quasar feedback from quasar winds. But uh, if you go to a conference where they're discussing clusters of galaxies, you'll come out of that thinking that it's mainly jets that are doing the feedback. Uh, and if you go to a star formation conference, you probably get a different idea. Um, so again, I'm going to focus on, on winds um, and uh, I, I, you know, the quasar feedback uh, via jets is a, obviously a, the main mechanism we believe is, uh, is happening in clusters of galaxies. But in the case of high redshift quasars, where most of them are radio quiet, um, I would argue that uh, quasar winds are probably a very important mechanism. Uh, so um, why are they important? I just mentioned the feedback process. Um, they might actually control the, uh, and be involved in the uh, regulation of the growth of the, the host galaxy and also their own growth. And initially, it was um, suggested that you know quasar winds could actually solve this angular momentum loss, like how do you get material falling into the, uh, the disk? Uh, famous paper by Blanford and Payne that showed that. Um, and just to think about something that was relevant to this conference. Um, hopefully with these new emissions, we might be able to probe uh, features in the absorption lines that we see because they are launched so close to the event horizon, uh, we might see those effects in the absorption lines as well. Um, all right, so uh, people have simulated um, uh, accretion, uh, 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 quasar outflows, and I'm just going to show you one hydro simulation done by Daniel Kroga, and just to get you an idea of that, uh, what the simulations are telling us. And this is a, uh, a quasar wind driven by radiation, um, uh, line driving mostly. I'll play this once again. The main uh, thing I want to point out is you, you actually see that the, the quasar winds are, you know, there's a large solid angle compared to jets that are very uh, narrow. Um, and you have material that's, uh, that raises from the disk thermally and then gets uh, uh, pushed by the uh, central source via radiation pressure and line driving. And uh, you, you create this very uh, nice collimated outflow. Um, right, so that's one mechanism, radiation line driving. Um, there are a lot of things we don't know about these winds. And I'll go through a few uh, observational aspects uh, to try to address these questions. Uh, what is the mechanism? I just uh, indicated one mechanism, radiation line driving. Another mechanism is magnetic uh, driving. Um, uh, I won't go into thermal driving because I'm, I'm essentially focusing on high velocity, relativistic type of uh, speeds. Uh, what is the geometry of the outflow? Um, uh, most, uh, many models uh, that were initially introduced um, postulated the presence of this shielding gas that will prevent the gas from being over ionized and that allows you to accelerate it to high velocities. So is that gas really necessary? Um, a 
Okay, so for the purposes of feedback, we need to constrain the properties of the outflow, um, column density ionization parameter, how do these quasars, uh, winds evolve, and how do they affect, is the amount of uh, mass outflow and efficiency of the flow large enough to actually uh, regulate the growth of the galaxy? So I'll try to address some of these questions in the following. All right, so briefly, uh, uh, just terminology here, uh, astronomers like to define things like how they look, and we eventually realize that may be the same thing, but terminology-wise, we, we, we can split quasars into narrow absorption line quasars, and if you look at their UV spectra, you see the emission lines in blue, blue width of the emission lines, you see narrow absorption lines, uh, typically of width uh, less than 500 kilometers per second are called narrow absorption lines. If the widths of those lines, though, are much broader, more than 2,000 kilometers per second, these are typically called broad absorption line quasars, and anything in between is a mini bow quasar. So that's what I'll use for the definition. But we now think that maybe uh, this is perhaps part of the, the distinction is an orientation effect. Uh, this is a, a little cartoon by uh, Fred Hamann, where depending on your uh, line of sight, you might see something as a broad absorption line quasar, or a mini bow, or a, a narrow absorption line quasar. Um, all right, so you could see that uh, the solid angle covered uh, by all of these combined could be pretty large. So the idea is that all quasars probably have these uh, massive outflows, uh, but we only uh, detect them if we happen to be looking uh, in the right direction. All right, so let me overview the two main mechanisms for uh, driving these outflows. So the, we have the radiation pressure mechanism and the magnetic uh, driving mechanism, which uh, initially the Blanford and Payne uh, talked about uh, magnetocentrifugal forces, um, and later on people uh, also had models where they considered mainly magnetic pressure, uh, or there are also models that are hybrids between radiation pressure and the magnetic driving uh, mechanism. So, uh, in the wind models, and the radiated wind models, essentially uh, radiation from the, the UV radiation from the disk uh, can either through electron scattering or um, absorption in resonant lines um, uh, push the, the gas to high velocities. And in, in the magnetic centrifugal, magnetocentrifugal wind models, it's, it's kind of like uh, having uh, a bead on a string, and as the accretion disk is moving and carrying the, the plasma with it, it can shoot it out at, at very large velocities. Uh, and these are some people who have actually worked on, on these models. Uh, recently, Fukumura has, has uh, taken, uh, an, as I'll show, an MHD simulation of, uh, of a, a magneto, mag magnetically driven wind. Uh, so the it's, it's pretty simple to just uh, uh, derive what the velocity of a wind would be if you're just driving it uh, via radiation. Um, you start with the equation of motion where you have the, the radiation term and then you have the, the gravity term. And if you want to incorporate the, uh, the line driving mechanism where you have momentum absorbed by the gas because of uh, various transitions, you, have, you include this force multiplier Essentially, this force multiply indicates by how, mu how much stronger is the radiative force compared to just simple uh, Thompson scattering. So um, the problem is, well, as I'll get later, this, this function, this uh, force multiplier is, is, uh, depends sensitively on the ionization of the gas. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is, you can easily derive this equation when you have just radiation driving and no magnetic fields. And what we realized very early on, we detected this, uh, uh, these absorption features in the x-rays uh, in a very distant quasar. And uh, we, <coughs> we detected outflows uh, with speeds of up to 0.4 C in this case. And um, then we just uh, said, well, where would you have to launch the wind uh, to get you know, that velocity and realize that um, in the same object, the UV outflow, uh, the, the, absorb, the UV absorbing material is outflowing at a much 
smaller velocity. So uh, you can easily obtain the, the, the velocities for the UV absorbing material just from radiation driving. But uh, it's very difficult to obtain these high relativistic velocities with radiation driving itself because the uh, Schwarzschild radius is about here for this object. So the essential is, and the UV emission is, is probably larger than 10 to the 17. So there's no UV emission there to launch to actually um, accelerate the, this X-ray absorber. So it's very unlikely that radiation driving uh, could actually get to a speed of 0.4 uh, C in this object. Um, the, um, and essentially, uh, turns out the, the, if the terminal velocity of, of the outflow is approximately the escape velocity, and it's, it depends on, as I mentioned, the, the force multiplier, but you can get a very large velocity if you move closer and closer to the event horizon, but at some point you just run out of uh, UV photons. Um, so another thing that, so what we first tried to see, well, could we save radiation pressure uh, driving by changing the ionizing source spectrum? So uh, what I mentioned, what I call SED is essentially the spectrum of the ionizing source. How does that affect the force multiplier? All right. So. And before I get to that, there are two main parameters of, of the, uh, the gas, the ionization parameter of the gas, which depends on the luminosity of the source and the distance of the uh, uh, source, uh, the gas from the source, and the total column density of the absorber. So what we tried then is to calculate this force multiplier for different values of this uh, hypothetical shield, shield, with a shield and without a shield, and for different uh, types of uh, SEDs. And you can play around, but you notice that the force multiplier, uh, when you get to large ionization parameters, drops considerably. So the, uh, the ionization parameters we observe are around here, around four, so you notice that, that the force multiplier is very low, so it's very large to explain these very fast relativistic outflows that we see by radiation driving alone. Um, um, the, the first uh, paper describing this approach of radiation line driving, I guess, was Marinadel, and he had postulated that the only way you could protect the gas uh, from getting over ionized was, was have a shield. Uh, later on, uh, Provedel showed that uh, you can actually, this shield is uh, produced by the wind itself. There's uh, the flow that essentially is, it fails. And it's, so the, the flow is actually uh, self-shielding. Um, so here's some uh, results from his simulations. Uh, this is a velocity uh, field diagram. And you can see again uh, that the velocity, the flow is actually constrained in, in a pretty small solid angle. Um, and uh, here you have the, the temperature uh, uh, distribution of the flow and so forth. All right, so the problems, as I mentioned, with explaining the relativistic outflows with uh, radiation driving alone is the ionization parameter that we observe of these X-ray absorbers is in the range of log of C of three to four to five, and at those ionization parameters, uh, the force multiplier, you can essentially cannot drive a gas, it's completely stripped. Uh, um, and, and second, the launch radii um, that we infer are very small, very close to the event horizon. So essentially, there's no UV emission there uh, inside that radius to drive the wind anyway. All right, so people then have derived uh, various other models to try, try to explain these relativistic outflows. Here is a model by, well, first the model by Blanford and Payne uh, said that you can actually drive a, uh, a wind using just centrifugal forces. Uh, later on, uh, uh, this is a work by Ebert et al. He combined uh, 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 magnetic, magnetocentrifugal forces essentially to launch, to launch the wind and then radiation pressure to, to push it from further on. Um, so what about magnetic driving, pure magnetic driving? Well, you have two terms 
Uh, one is the magnetic tension term, and the other one is the magnetic pressure term. Um, so, and the nice thing about magnetic driving is you don't require a shielding gas, and uh, so you can drive winds at, at high ionization, uh, with a high ionization parameter. Um, so one distinction that these two models make, and maybe we can uh, at some point uh, uh, look into the data and see if we can distinguish uh, between uh, this, is the magnetocentrifugal forces, the, the, the material will have a large, uh, will be co-rotating with the disk, whereas radial driving far away is probably going out radially. So perhaps in the, in the spectra we could actually distinguish between these two models. Um, so this is a, a recent model just came out by Fukumura et al. where for different, um, in their parameterization, uh, they allow the density profile to be either 1 over r or 1 over r to the minus 1.5. And they actually, uh, so models A and B here have this, parent, uh, this dependence of density uh, versus radius. And essentially, they can get a large uh, variety of outflows depending on varying these parameters and also varying the, the angular momentum of the wind. Um, so uh, again, I, I wasn't really convinced, based with the, uh, the sensitivity of their models, uh, to creating a essentially any type of outflow they wanted to. But you know, in their paper, they actually quote me as saying, oh, we have been able to explain the relativistic outflows in uh, APM 079 based on you know, their model. But, um, so anyway, this is uh, the, the observation that um, kind of one of the first observations that indicated that relativistic outflows were, uh, were there in, in, in quasars. Uh, this is a high redshift quasar around redshift of 3.9. It's gravitationally lensed. And what we noticed is that uh, at high energies, we see these very blue shifted absorption features. Uh, IM25 should actually appear at this energy. Uh, and these features, and these are observations of the same object at different epochs. So the absorption features would vary on um, very short time scales. The time difference between here and here is, let's say it's October 6th, October 22nd. Uh, so, uh, and in the rest frame, that turns out to be around three days. So in three days, you see changes in the um, structure of the absorption features. Um, so this is kind of a hint that um, what's causing this is, is in, on very small scales. Um, also, to get to these very large velocities, you have to probably launch the wind at around uh, 2RG uh, or so. Um, so what we did is we modeled this spectrum with a photonization model to infer the ionization parameter um, and the mass outflow rate. And what we find is that the mass outflow rate is about, for this particular one observation, was about 20 or so solar masses per year. So it's very comparable to the actual accretion rate. Uh, so uh, this was a kind of a first indication that these quasars have very powerful outflows uh, with efficiencies, this is the ratio of the uh, kinetic energy rate injected over the volumetric luminosity of uh, order unity. And we, we actually keep finding these large efficiencies in many other quasars. And that's another reason why we think that uh, radiation driving, obviously, you, you can't have an uh, efficiency larger than one. And it's, it has to be larger, smaller than the covering fraction. So this is another indication that uh, having such large efficiencies, it must be magnetic driving that's pushing this wind. Um, so we also plotted, uh, uh, since we had many observations of this uh, quasar, different epochs, we looked at the velocity of the outflow uh, as a function of the, the, uh, the shape of the X-ray spectrum. And we find that as the spectrum uh, slope gets larger, so it gets steeper, uh, the velocity of the outflow gets larger. Um, and also the column density uh, increases as a function of the spectral slope. Um, 
Uh, also, this is the efficiency of the outflow versus the shape of the spectrum. And you can see the efficiency, even though they're uh, I've made very large error bars, uh, is relatively large and, and hard to explain uh, that, uh, this by radiation gravity alone. Um, all right, so why do we think that the outflow is originating very close to the black hole? Well, uh, if we approximate the observed outflow velocity with the terminal velocity of the flow, we should get a, a launching radius, radius about two Schwarzschild radii. Uh, from the variability analysis, we get a few uh, Schwarzschild radii. And the fact that the ionization parameter is very high means that we must be launching very close to the black hole uh, also. So uh, none of these methods alone is, is, is very uh, robust, but the fact that they all kind of point to a very small uh, launching radius is, is kind of indicative. Um, other objects that have shown these relativistic outflows is this object, which is also a, a mini bell quasar, PDS456. This is uh, data by Reeves et al. And again, you see where the iron, this is the 26th line, should be, and you see the blue shifted to very high velocities uh, 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 observed line and indicating an outflow velocity of about 0.25 to 0.3 C. All right, so recently, uh, Tom Bessie et al. conducted a survey of nearby safer galaxies. And what he found was that about 40% of all safers have these ultra-fast outflows, UFOs. And, um, so here's the distribution of the velocity of those uh, fast outflows. You see that typically uh, they range between 0.1 and, and 0.3, uh, very large column densities. So this was kind of a nice uh, result showing that in the nearby universe, even uh, uh, safer type galaxies have these uh, ultra-fast flows. Um, all right, so I. Yeah, I mentioned some X-ray observations of fast outflows in broad absorption line quasars. Uh, we uh, also looked at the narrow absorption line quasars to see, well, what, what's happening there. Uh, recently, there have been a lot of observations where they've detected very fast outflows in the UV, up to 60 or 70,000 kilometers per second. Um, and everyone who works in this field usually wants to publish a cartoon, and I just picked two. Uh, this one was pretty, is pretty famous, the Elvis 2000. Uh, another one here, Ganguly et al. And one of the things we wanted to, so these are very useful just to get an idea of what the outflow might look like. And this is a combination of, I guess, when this came out, the simulations from Progo are already available, so they could combine all that information to produce such a plot. Uh, but if you notice in this picture, they, they indicated that you know, for a now quasar, you're looking below the outflow, main outflow. And we kind of didn't agree with that, but we wanted to prove that, so we collected a lot of X-ray observations of now quasars, and we predicted that if, if the line of sight was, was at a, such a large inclination angle, you should see a lot of column density. Right? Um, we, but we, our, our idea is probably for now quasars, you're probably looking at a smaller inclination angle, which means you should see a smaller amount of column density. All right, so. The original uh, sample came from a collection by Keitler et al. Uh, uh, quasars a redshift between two and four, high resolution tech spectra. And um, so uh, after very tedious work, um, uh, uh, they found that these absorption lines were actually intrinsic. It's not trivial to, you see an absorption line, an outer line, and now quasar, that doesn't mean it's associated with the quasar. You have to actually perform either a partial uh, covering analysis or variability analysis to show that it's intrinsic. So we, we have the sample of intrinsic nows, and we actually observe uh, about 20 of them in the x-rays. Uh, so this is the sample that we, we've got time on uh, Chandra and Suzaku and XMM, and you can see on this column what their UV velocities. So already these are objects that have very fast UV velocities so we were interested to see what, was their, what were their X-ray properties, their absorption properties. Okay, so um, this is the result. 
all right? So let me describe what this parameter is. But this dash curve, so this alpha x is an indicator of the x-ray weakness. More negative values of alpha, alpha x means probably more absorption in the x-rays. But essentially, alpha x is the ratio of the flux density in the UV over the flux density in the x-rays. Flux density at 2,500 angstroms over the flux density at um, uh, 2 kV. And again, the more negative this value is, the more x-ray absorbed. So this dashed curve is uh, the distribution for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey quasars with no absorption. So for non-absorbed quasars, the distribution should be like this. And we were very surprised. We were expecting at least a little bit of absorption. These are actually on the, uh, on the uh, right-hand side, which means uh, there must be either UV absorbed or 2x-ray two two bright. Um, again, this is just a simple ratio of x-ray to opticals to UV. So we're kind of surprised. So we'll, then what we did is we created this plot looking of this is the, the difference between the observed alpha x uh, minus the expected, and again, going to the left is more X-ray absorbed. So the sample of bowel quasars, which are hit a very X-ray weak, this uh, this makes sense. Their alpha X is very uh, negative. This delta alpha X is very negative. This is the Sloan sample. It's, it's centered around zero, but the, this is a sample of mostly mini bowels, and you see it's slightly less uh, shifted towards the left. And this is our sample that's actually shifted towards the right. So this was kind of like, well, first, it confirmed our hypothesis that you must be viewing at a small inclination angle when you're looking at now, so not in a very large one, because you essentially have no x-ray absorption. But this was puzzling that we had you know, this positive shift. Um, and also, when we looked at the velocities of the UV velocities of the outflows as a function of alpha x, this was a, a kind of opposite of what we expected. As you get uh, uh, x-ray brighter here, uh, you can see that the velocity is increasing. Um, you'd think that if there was a shield uh, related to uh, accelerating the outflow, you might see the opposite trend. So um, we're still trying to interpret these results. Um, so in, anyway, I had mentioned that I put this star next to this one, now quasar. What would be nice to actually see a, uh, a manifestation of the alpha in the X-ray spectrum, like an absorption line. And what I noticed when I was analyzing this data set that this guy was two X-ray bright uh, for its uh, redshift. And since I do a little bit of work in the, in the field of gravitational lensing, I realized, ah, oh, this optic looks familiar. I think it's a gravitational lens. And actually, this quasar is a gravitational lens. It has a magnification factor of about 80. So essentially, you know, this is a looking to, at an object that we, we would have no chance of identifying. Uh, this is a, a five kilosecond Chandra observation, very short Chandra observation. And we actually see, uh, uh, even in this five kilosecond spectrum, uh, indication hints of uh, blue shifted features, indicating an outflow of about uh, 0.5 C. Uh, a few months ago, another now quasar was uh, found to have absorption features indicating a relativistic outflow as well. So right now we have two now quasars, two now just quasars, where their X-ray spectra also indicate the presence of a relativistic outflow. So it's not only bowel quasars that appear to have these relativistic outflows. Um, so uh, this is just the Hubble uh, Space Telescope image of HS0810. Uh, it's a quad, um, and this is the Chandra spectrum deconvolved here. Um, and again, we hope with upcoming observations to, to get a better spectrum of this guy. Um, so let me uh, show you our interpretation. Um, all right, so our interpretation is uh, why do we get these positive alpha x's from now quasar? It has to do, we think, maybe this is one interpretation with our line of sight. We're looking, when we're looking at, at now quasars, they're at, they're at a small inclination angle. So we actually miss this shielding gas. We don't see it. So we don't, they're not X-ray absorbed. And we're looking towards the corona. Whereas for um, 
the UV line of sight, you actually are looking through the, uh, uh, through the shield. And perhaps, uh, again, these flows are driven by different mechanisms. The X-ray outflow perhaps is driven mostly by magnetic driving uh, and doesn't require a shield, whereas the UV outflows, which are at a smaller velocity, are driven by radiation pressure mostly, and they do require the shield. Um, so as we heard earlier in the, the meeting, uh, there's rumors out about Athena Plus. Um, um, I had done a lot of uh, simulations during the IXO era in Constellation X, and I did a few uh, for the Athena team, and this is one. This is what um, APM would look like with Athena. We could actually track the acceleration of the absorber uh, with relatively short exposures, and that would actually tell us a lot about the mechanism of the driving, but also related to this conference, uh, if indeed the uh, absorber is launched at 2RG, what we should see is, uh, uh, you know, distortions of that absorption line profile. It would be really interesting to see, especially at the very, uh, when it's just launched, we'll see the effect of uh, red gravitational redshift as well. So the line might actually go back and forth before it, uh, so it'll be, be kind of interesting to see what happens. Um, and another simulation uh, that I stole from Massimo Capi of another object, 3C111. Three, three uh, so I'm going to put up my, my uh, results. And one thing I, I was trying to think about, uh, uh, something I could say related to this conference of mergers, is one aspect that I think has not been discussed is the influence of the outflows during the merger. Uh, these outflows are very powerful in these quasars, 20 solar masses per year, so I can see a, a big black hole blowing away in, during the merger. How would that outflow influence the disk of the other uh, object uh, that, that's merging in? Um, I don't know, it's probably not important, but maybe there are some aspects of the, the wind actually uh, hitting the other accretion disk and, and <coughs> maybe seeing iron k alpha line from the other disk as well. Um, anyway, that was just something I wanted to throw in for theorists, um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you.